Lizzy, and welcome to the University of Guam Press's Menyetlo Nimentitigi Creative Conversation. Guahusi Victoria, Lola Leon Guerrero, and I'm the managing editor of the University of Guam Press. Uh, before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we're doing today. Um, with the vision of enlightening the world about the peoples and cultures of the Micronesian Islands, the University of Guam Press advances regional scholarship, develops cultural literacy, and expands accessibility to knowledge about Micronesia by providing high quality peer reviewed publishing services. Um, so the University of Guam Press has been actively publishing uh, since its revival five years ago in 2015. And um, we've also developed a new imprint, Taiguini Books, which is dedicated to publishing cultural literature for adults and children. Uh, under that imprint, uh, we are very honored to have um, published a, a revisit of the famous novel, Marikisa, written by Chris Harris Howard. And today we have Mr. Howard joining us as part of what we're calling our creative conversation. So the University of Guam Press recognized that in order to support a robust literary canon in our region, we really wanted to start by providing uh, support to our local writers. Um, we developed a, fellow, a fellowship called Menyetlo Ni Mentitigi, um, which literally translates to siblings who write together. Um, and the Menyetlo Ni Mentitigi Writers Fellowship uh, was supported by a grant that we applied for from the Guam Economic Development Authority. And so um, with their generous support and with the incredibly talented writers we have in our community, we've been uh, running this fellowship since the beginning of the year um, with active peer review writing workshops, craft exercises, um, we're reading together, we're um, basically just focusing on our writing in whatever ways that looks like um, as part of the fellowship. And so one of the things that was really important to us was to be able to hear from published authors. And so um, we're very fortunate that um, we have authors in our community that are so willing to share their time and expertise with us, including um, Mr. Howard. So I'll jump right in and, and kind of give you a little bit of an idea of who he is and then um, we'll, we'll go into our Q&A today. So uh, Chris Perez Howard uh, believes that his adventurous spirit and endless curiosity are responsible for his unconventional life. Among his experiences, he served in the US military, worked for the Amer American Express Company in New York, struggled as an artist in Rome, Italy, lived in Yap, the Seychelles, and the Philippines, and went to Africa to see wild animals in their natural habitat. In Guam, he has worked as a teacher, a news editor for the Guam Tribune, an assistant to the president of the Guam Community College, and a press secretary for the governor of Guam. Academically, he attended the University of Alabama and Indiana University, and he graduated magna cum laude from the University of New Hampshire with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. Chris is also a Chamorro rights activist and is a former chairman of the Organization of People for Indigenous Rights and has presented testimony before the United Nations and the US Congress. He is presently working on his third novel. Uh, his first novel is uh, Marikisa, the, the novel that the University of Guam Press worked with him to republish last, last year. But he's also written a novel about his father entitled Edward. And so um, we're very happy today to welcome him as we talk about what it's like to document family history as he's done with Marikisa, the novel about his mother, and uh, Edward, the novel about his father. Um, but before we dive into the conversation, we'd like to tell you a little bit about who's going to be talking with Chris today. Uh, to introduce our participating writers, I'd like to welcome our Manyetlo Nimentitigi Writers Fellowship Coordinator, uh, Akina Chargalov. Happy day, Akina. We'll be joined by a group of writers who are actively participating in peer review writing workshop groups through this fellowship. So please welcome Megan Tidegui, Johanna Salinas, Edward Faji Jr., Nina Carolino, and who will be later joined by Dr. Miguel Babakwa. So Mr. Howard, would you like to share your opening remarks? Well, hop a day and uh, thank you for joining in this conversation on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, I was anxious uh, appearing here because writing is such a, a broad discipline that it's, uh, I didn't know what I would be saying, but I'll start off by 
giving you a little background is that uh, I was born in 1940. So that was 80 years ago. I uh, was on Guam uh, for two years between 1949 and 1951. And then uh, I left and didn't return for another 40 years. So I've had a very uh, strange upbringing because of Marquita, because of my, the death of my mother. Uh, when I first started to write the book, I didn't know that much about her, and I thought it would be interesting to write it because I, I had been somewhat influenced by Michener South Pacific. I don't know if you've uh, read that or seen the movie, but, but it was a movie that had uh, the native inhabitants and the military in it. And in many uh, instances, it was a very joyful thing. So I said, oh, my mother and her girlfriends would make a very good beginning for this book. Little did I know that it wouldn't end up that way. The rhythm of my book when I first started was that it would proceed slowly and happily and then build up to a crescendo. I never really thought about the crescendo. So when writing it, I captured the beginning and uh, building it up. But unlike the South Pacific, it didn't go up in a crescendo and then level off. It was abruptly ended with her death. So what I started to write and what I ended up writing was different than the vision that I had. So I think everyone should realize that sometimes what we start writing isn't necessarily what it's going to end up looking like. Uh, I was able to spend time in order to smoothen that section out, but it wasn't until I revised the book that I was able to deal with the rhythm of the book uh, in order for it not to come crashing down, but to be a little bit more understandable and uh, also educational. I'm ready for your questions. <laughs> Thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, yeah, I never shared that before. I never shared it before. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, I think that uh, you really achieved that um, because you painted a whole world around. It wasn't just the tragedy at the end, but you know, my mom actually last night, I was telling her what we were doing today. And she goes, will you please tell him that I read that book over and over. And the part I really love to read is, is the part where I could just picture them all in Hagatnya with their dresses and so did us and just that life, right? The, the joyfulness of that period, it really um, sets the reader up for how, what a stark contrast it was under occupation. But to be able to read a book that has all of that range of emotion, like my mom said, it's something you really want to return to. She said that she, my grandmother was, you know, would have been a teenager at that time. And so she's imagining if my grandmother was like your mother, right? And, and what it was like for her right before the war. So you did that very nicely. Um, so Thank yeah, you. without uh, further ado, uh, Akina, would you like to introduce the first writer who will ask a question today? Sure. So first up, we have Megan Tidegui. She is a high school English teacher at Southern High and inspired author. So Megan, whenever you're ready with your question. Papa Day, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, Hi, my Megan. question for you. Hi, my question for you today is, um, how do you write about family without like causing family drama? Oh, that's, that's a nice question. Is that 
when I started uh, writing, as you realize, uh, it was a long time ago. And at that time, the ones that I, were, I was interviewing didn't want to talk about their war years. It was only after years later, after some people had started relating their experiences that uh, others started coming forward. <clears throat> there were times when I felt that the family was not all on board with delving into the past and uh, uh, the problems because it also, you're also not looking at the good things, you're, you're looking at family problems too and, the, and also problems from one family to the other. Uh, I was able to meet with them and discuss a lot of the, the things with them, although not fully because they were still reluctant to talk about. So your problems are probably a little different than mine because mine was sort of like a block, blockade, whereas yours are, you're able to seep in just little areas of it. Um, I think that the only thing that you can assure them of is that you just want to be honest and tell the truth and to make sure that you get all sides of whatever uh, part of the story you're researching. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Is there, is there anything else that you may 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 want to uh, ask me to expound upon on that question, Megan? How would you like go about dealing with what the family would say, like in terms of like being reluctant? You know, sometimes you're just going to have to write about the reluctance. You're not going to get everything that you want. So you have to write about why you're not getting it. That's what I, 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 would, I, I, I would do. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Thank you, Megan. So up next, we have Johanna Salinas, a UOG graduate and inspiring English teacher. Off a day, um, Mr. Uh, Howard, sir. Hi, I really appreciated your story. Uh, we read it during my Guam history class long ago at UOG, and I will. I'm interested in checking your revisited version. So, um, my question for you is: I know you've li lived an interesting life, going all over the world and trying um, crazy creative things. So, I'm just wondering. Like, why is it important for creative people to always find, uh, be seeking new things, uh, to not just stay within, our, within ourselves and to always experience uh, different parts of the world? You know, um, you don't have to physically travel. You can also travel through books. Many of the things that I have read and which I enjoy very much are those books that are written by those living in other countries. I particularly, uh, some of them that I, I enjoyed was uh, Isabel Allende uh, from Argentina and <clears throat> Love in the Time of Cholera with uh, Gabrielle Marquez. So you can, read books that are in other countries that are written by someone from those countries that are dealing with uh, uh, the culture of the country itself. 
I learned so much through reading. And his strengths that you would bring up, uh, I mean, that if you're an English teacher, because frankly, I'm not that good in English. I've done all these things and stuff like that. And even working, uh, you know, as an editor in a newspaper and uh, done a lot of writing in it. But if you read a lot, sometimes instinctively, you know when something is written wrong. But if you ask me what a past participle is and all that stuff, I wouldn't have any idea. So I can just say, read, read, read. And, you know, uh, that would be uh, your, your, your best avenue into, uh, into feeding into your creativity. Okay. Are you surprised? <laughs> uh, I'm yeah, not I was, good I was at I mean, I was hoping you would tell us some crazy story you had back in, in Micronesia or in Philippines. <laughs> here, I have a lot of crazy stories. All right, I look forward to it in the next book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Chris, maybe you can share one of your favorites, something that Johanna might uh, enjoy or take away from your travels. Do you, uh, let me see, I can, I, the, the first one that, that comes to mind is uh, not a very happy one. Um, I think we'll, we'll do that to another day because it, it's lengthy and I'd like to hear more questions. I've had adventures, yes. All right, all right, I'll just read it in the next book. Thank you, Joanna. That's, that brings up another topic, motivation. It's hard for me to be motivated now. You know, after you've seen a lot and done a lot of things, it's difficult to get motivated. So that's, that's the problem I have now is motivation. Even money doesn't help. Thank you, Johanna. All right, and up next we have Edward Foggy Jr., a UOG student who's working towards his bachelor's in English with a minor in writing and tomorrow studies. Today, um, I just have to say that I'm currently reading Marikita for um, my class in EMT 3.3. It's a uh, Pacific literature and I, I love it. I love it so much. It's, if it was already on my book list and the story is just, it's marvelous to capture. It's such a rare time the, in, like, to be recorded. And I have so much appreciation for um, its documentation. So I want to foremost thank you. And uh, also- for One thing, let me thank you. Because when I get feedback like this, it means so much. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I, uh, the pleasure is all mine. There's, uh, I guess, my question is, so far, you've been answering it through the, the past act, um, answers, actually. It's having to do with, um, I guess, writing. So uh, my question is, what advice can you give to up-and-coming local writers? OK. You know, there was no way I could prepare for this uh, uh, conversation or interview. But there are things that I've been thinking about. And one of the things I'm thinking about is that when you're writing something, you have to think of your audience. Who, what is the audience that you have? And because you're talking to that audience, you're, you're, you're talking to those people. And so you have to envision who those people are. That, I think, is uh, one of the important things, is knowing your audience. <clears throat> it's, it's very um, difficult if you have an audience broader than the local audience, because we're at a disadvantage because a lot of people don't know why. If I said something about uh, 
something happened in Indiana, in the United States, people already have an understanding perhaps about Indiana. But if you say Guam, they don't know it. So we're always having to explain where Guam is, about Guam, that it has a native population and everything. So we have to realize our audience in order to in order to formulate our book so it, it, it reaches those that we want to, uh, to uh, talk to. And also, I think it's Im important, besides the audience, is to know that you're communicating. A lot of writers, the reason why they write is because they have something to say. So they, they want to express that. My, uh, my uh, discipline, uh, you could say it was created because it's in the arts, was uh, painting. I got a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree <coughs> in painting. I was an oil painter. But when I returned to Guam to think about painting in oils in a tropical country was not you know, good. And also that type of art in that uh, period of time didn't reach that many people because uh, the culture itself at, at that time wasn't promoting the, the, those types of arts to be undertaken by their children. So I turned to writing. And so the creativity that I had is there all the time, whether you're a writer, you're a painter, you're a musician. And I went into writing because I had a lot to say, particularly when I came back and found out I was learning about who I was, what I stood for, uh, what was missing in my life. I had so much to say I had to start writing. And I am actually, I'm very happy that I did because I was able to reach people. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. So up next, we have Nina Carolino. Nina is an administrative accounting assistant for her family's business and is a blogger and aspiring novelist. Hi, Mr. Howard. Hi, Thank Nina. You. Thank you for joining us and um, being able to talk to us today. Um, I really, it, the book you wrote was really heartwarming and thank you for uh, sharing the story of your mother. I think that, um, especially the genre that you, it's such a unique genre that I think was really important to show how, uh, what Guam was like at the time in a creative way, but also giving uh, as much biography and truth to it. So thank you for that. And um, one of my questions was, uh, well, what do you think was the hardest part of your research um, process? The hardest part uh, definitely was uh, speaking with those that survived the war and, and really didn't want to talk about it. I really didn't get all the information that I needed, but I got what I could get at the time. I believe that the, the Guam novel has not been written yet. I believe it's there to be written. What was missing, even in my novel to some extent, was spirituality, was the spirituality of the culture, of the Chamorro culture. This has been touched upon in a number of different ways. Uh, I came across an interesting one uh, recently when I read 
the dissertation of uh, Craig Santos Paris and his dissertation on the area that had to do with my book, with Marquita, he saw it in terms that I hadn't seen it before in relation to the culture, in relation to spirituality. And I think that, I really think that the Guam novel has not been written. I think that's one that has lived their life within the Chamorro culture would be able to bring that aspect out of it. And as I mentioned uh, about those two writers before from other countries, that's what they had in those, their books. And that I think is missing in uh, the Guam novel. Did I answer your question? Sometimes, sometimes it's just, it's like I, I get off on some tangent, right? And I think a lot of times it's because I've been thinking of these for the last week, knowing that I was going to be on this. And in some way, I have found a way of weaving it into our conversation. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you, Nina. Now we have Dr. Miguel Mavakwa. Dr. Mavakwa is a Guam historian, writer, and one of our workshop facilitators and founders of the Guam Bus, a local publishing company. Good day, buenas, senor parents. Hi. Good day. And so um, there's a lot of things that I want to I wanna talk to you about, of course, because we were supposed to meet and then the, the pandemic happened. But... Uh, <laughs> But so, well, a lot of things have happened, right? <laughs> the, 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 the election is, is ongoing. <laughs> First, I want to tell you that I, I really respect and admire a lot of things that you've been doing. Okay. And so just know that. Oh, thank, no, thank you. From coming from you, I appreciate that because I've studied uh, many of the things that you did in your life, too. The things that you've written and the things that you've stood for it. So I definitely appreciate that. So uh, one thing that I wanted to, to ask about though, because um, so oftentimes when you are a community activist, sort of there's, uh, cause you mentioned earlier, sort of something that you wanna say, right? But oftentimes the political speech can get in the way of creative speech. And sometimes they go together very nicely. And then sometimes one will constrict the other. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, like if you are an activist and you have a cause, sometimes you'll put it into your characters too much, right? Mm -hmm. So that it won't feel natural, it won't feel right. Um, but then other times, sometimes people will try to keep them so separate so that their creative work doesn't connect to the things that they believe in, their principles and so on. And so um, as somebody who was a community activist for a long time, but also a creative writer. What are your thoughts on sort of um, that distinction, how to bring them together, how much they should be separate? It's, it's very difficult. I remember when I first returned to Guam and I started uh, getting involved in the uh, indigenous rights movement at the time. And I became chairman a lot of the reasons why I became chairman was that I did not have a political identity. I hadn't been on island long enough to have been branded as, I don't know if branded is the right word, branded as a Democrat or a Republican or an activist or, you know, talking out, out of my head. So I was put in that position, and I'll tell you that the forces, when I started uh, expounding on the Chamorro issues, it was met with an opposition. 
And that opposition at the time was the Pacific Daily News, because that was <clears throat> the largest and uh, the most influential. And as you know, the Pacific Daily News is uh, a US paper. It does have local people in it. I think has it, it's changed, but I don't think uh, we have a local newspaper voice at that time, the strictly local newspaper voice. I'm not talking about race or anything like that. I'm talking about the real political and cultural concerns of the Chamorro people in today's, in today's world. Uh, I see that there have been a, a number of changes, but it's, it's not an easy road. And sometimes you're going to have to choose between one or the other. Um, it's good if you have a career backing that will support you while you're doing the things that, that you want to do as far as an activist. But if you don't have that, you're going to have to make a serious choice between going full force, being an, uh, an activist, or just being in the middle of the road. Uh, it's almost like choosing as an artist do you want to be an artist or do you want to make money? It's, there's a balance that has to be uh, made. And I think it's uh, something that each individual has to confront of their own and what serves them the best. I don't think there is any one best is what each individual, what uh, that individual uh, sees is best for them. And I wouldn't fault that for anybody. No. Just well. uh, thank you. That, that question leads really nicely into what I kind of wanted to bring up uh, from the book itself. And so um, I wanted to share a little bit about just the honor of working with Chris on this revisited edition. Um, first of all, it was first written in 1982, which is the year that I was born. Um, and for Chris, writing this oh, book no. was very painful. Um, it, he, his mother died when he was so young that his memories of her are very, are very blurred at this point. They're very small. They're, you know, he was so young that what he remembered of his mother was so few and is mostly what others shared with him about her. And so in writing the book, it actually started not as a book, but as his own journey to discover who she was. And so once he kind of wrote it all out, it was difficult for him to revisit. And so imagine us coming back over 30 years later and saying, okay, let's take a look at this again before we republish it. And so there were two moments, particularly that in the revisit, I think, Chris, you had a, a new idea of both your mom and maybe not so new of your dad, but looking at the actual historical records that you had that gave you their voice. And so one of the things I always found really interesting about Marikita is that to do his mother justice, Chris really tried to stick to um, the facts as much as he could. So you'll see in some of the letters that are included and even in the congressional record or the recording of, of her tragedy at the end, he writes it in the story, but you get the actual transcripts and you can see how much she sort of stuck to the story that was given to him and then filled in the gaps, right, based on interviews and discussions. So one particular um, quote that was actually his mother's words that I think in the revisit really spoke to him more than it had in 1982, and, and we talked about this, was that a, a journalist had come to Guam and for a popular American magazine wrote an article called Guam Haunted Paradise uh, on April 18, 1939. 
Um, and so I'm just going to read the excerpt and, and give you a taste of Marikita's voice. Um, there is a school in Agania built and supported by special taxes levied on the Navy personnel, cigarettes, and luxuries at the commissary with a per head charge of $1.50 monthly for officers' children and $1 for enlisted men. This is called the American School. What do they mean by that name, demands Marikita. Aren't all schools in Guam American schools? Don't we salute the same flag, sing the same patriotic hymns in our classrooms, love and respect the same great men? I know they pay especially for it while our children go free, but don't you think it's a very tactless name? And so in revisiting her actual words in this magazine, I said, Chris, you're, you inherited your mother's activism. In, in 1939, she was just a teenager making this statement in a national magazine. It really gives you a sense of her spirit. And, and Chris, if you could speak a little bit about how in the revisiting of the book, how did that speak to you differently than it did in 1982? And then I'll follow up with the question about your dad. For one thing is that I found out that I did remember my mother, but it was an emotional memory. And that I think uh, is uh, something that is a memory that will always be there, is my emotional memory of her loss, which apparently affected me deeply when I was uh, a child. Now, the activism. Writing uh, the book and doing the research required a, a lot of effort, more effort that I really didn't want to spend. I thought I was going to just be writing this ha ha ha, da 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 da, you know, story, right? <clears throat> but as I wrote, I realized that I had to, it was important that I verify everything. So in my research, I tried very hard to get all the factual elements. If anybody goes and researches the history of Guam, at least close to what I researched, they become an activist because it is something that wasn't the events and the things that occurred during that time is, not, is something that hadn't been taught in the schools. We didn't have the books. We didn't have people talking about those periods of time. To talk anything about the federal government, it was that you were anti-American, completely branded at that time. But if anyone, it really delves into the history of Guam. <clears throat> there was no way that it wouldn't change your perception of life on Guam and the life of the Chamorros. Is there anything else? <laughs> yeah, so the other part of this the sort of... Um... No, it, it, I'm serious. And the thing is, is that it's so frustrating when I still find people say, uh, you know, countering things that are readily apparent to me about the injustice done during those times and that are continuing up to today. And it's frustrating and we just have to get more history our history into the educational system, into uh, writings, into uh, a number of different ways, but it's important. 
Absolutely. And I think that's what your mother was questioning, right? It's sort of like, well, oh where, where are we equal? I, um, are we until I understood and read more, did I uh, understand her and her feelings? I had just read that article. Oh, how nice. Someone from the U.S. for a very important magazine at the time came. And my mother was, you know, interviewed and everything. And it was an awakening. It was an awakening to find out that she wasn't just this typical island girl that you usually read about is that she had political thoughts. She uh, voiced her opinions. And uh, this was at a time when uh, only a few Chamorros did. And most of those uh, that were, uh, has been acknowledged, were those in uh, the political world. But there were others, like my mother. Yeah. So the second part of my question in terms of the revisit is that you had brought a binder of letters to me, letters that hadn't been in the original version of Marikita. And I said, we need to just put these in because you'd already included a couple letters. But I remember one particular letter that when you brought me the binder, you had said, wow, reading this again and kind of knowing your father, growing up with your father, right? But kind of revisiting it later, what stood out to you is the letter that your father wrote when you were born. And this was written in September 20, 1940 to your grandmother in Indiana. And he said, um, he's describing you and he says, uh, he doesn't, he drinks around a, a one and a half to two ounces of milk every four hours. He has a pug nose like his mother. And I think to her goes the greatest resemblance. His complexion seems normal and he is very rosy cheeked. <laughs> And I remember you had questioned, oh, well, should we include this? And looking at it, your father calling your complexion normal, you recognize that your father still had racism that had come with him to Guam. And in this, this chapter is called A Marriage of Cultures. And so I think one of the interesting things is sometimes we look at parts of our family and our family history, and we see things that may we may not be proud of, but we can't hide from them. They're part of who we are. It's part of this marriage of cultures that many of us come from. And so I wanted you to talk a little bit about that discovery, just that simple detail. What did that mean to you that your complexion was normal? And then later on, you did write your father's story in Edward. And so, you know, just a little context, Marikita um, married uh, a Navy man who is Chris's father. And um, she at first really resisted him. She didn't want to fit into the stereotype of the local girl marrying, you know, the white naval man, but she did. And then rather quickly thereafter, he was shipped off to Japan as a prisoner of war. And so just like he did with his mother, Chris tried to also tell his father's story, but found little details like this. What, what did that reveal to you? And what was that process like for you kind of trying to write about him? <clears throat> One thing, I was very fortunate that there were letters because they were sent to my grandmother, uh, Howard, in the, the state of Indiana. And uh, so those survived. So I was very fortunate to have that. Let's not think that that type of attitude remains in the past because they exist also today. Those types of attitudes of people coming, I'm sorry, but from people coming from the US, coming here, they bring sometimes a set of attitudes which they don't realize that they hold and, but are there. Um, I, I understand it 
but I would think that through time it would change. And this isn't only people coming from the States. I remember when it's also something that had been programmed here on Guam. I remember when I first came back and I had come, uh, I had been living in uh, St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands at the time. And there we're always on the beach, sun tanning, you know, uh, having our uh, rum drinks and everything. So when I returned to Guam, I was quite brown. I have one of those skins that if I'm in the sun a long time, I turn dark. When I'm not, maybe it's the little Chinese in me, I turn light. And, and also the Spanish. Uh, and my, one of my uncles said after I'd been back for a while, because I had come, you know, fully dark and I thought really nice looking and <laughs> with my color. <laughs> and after I'd been on Guam for a while and I had been working uh, inside for some time, of course I faded. And he mentioned, he said, oh, it's good that you're light now. So it, it, isn't, it wasn't only the attitudes that come from other places also affects the attitudes here. So those things uh, have existed. They persist today, but maybe not to, to as great an extent. Uh, but it was something when I uh, read that section, I said, uh oh, <laughs> uh oh, my father, you know, had those preconceived conditions. And I'm sure, especially with the others that he were uh, around, uh, names for Chamorro, gooks, and, you know, all that stuff like that, uh, that was something that was. Uh, natural in their daily conversations. So it's one, what one feels in their heart that's important. It's one, what feels in their heart and what they demonstrate that's important. <laughs> I Thank you for sharing. I gave you a little insight into that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Mr. Howard, it's okay if we go through another round of questions. Our fellows are sure. just really eager. To, okay, perfect. Sure, I just hope that um, uh, my a voice holds up. Hmm. Am I talking too loud? Maybe that's why I'm. Oh no, you're no. perfect. But anytime you need to take a break, just let us know. Okay. Um, so Megan, did you want to start off the second round? So my second question: um, What was your process and approach to your fact finding um, throughout your novel and? Um, how important is it to ask permission from the people you're, you're getting your research from? Um, actually, I was fortunate because um, I didn't speak Chamorro, and I still don't speak Chamorro. I don't know if it's psychological or what, because I spoke Chamorro. My sister and I spoke Chamorro, but when, when we left to the United States and we weren't around Charles and uh, actually my, my father took me aside and said, you, you, you guys shouldn't be speaking that because you're stepbrothers and sisters and you know, other people. Uh, I don't know what they were afraid of, of what we were conspiring to do in Chaparro. But uh, I unlearned it. Uh, in fact, I tried several times to, uh, to join classes at the university. They were always canceled because there weren't enough people that wanted to take it during that time. Um, I also think I have a psychological thing. I, I don't remember anything before five years old, maybe a few fleeting lamp glimpses, but uh, uh, I think that uh, Emotionally, uh, I'm afraid to, that if I learned the language, I probably could learn and see and feel more than I wanted to. So 
I don't speak it. So I was fortunate to have my uh, aunt, my aunt Carmen. Uh, she was uh, very supportive of what I was doing. And she took me to see various friends and my mother, uh, relatives. She would translate. Uh, I would put some things on tape so that I would have it readily available for my writing later. Um, It was very difficult. Um, I think that when you're interviewing people like that, I think that if they if they feel comfortable and understand that you're feeling what they feel, I think that if, if you are open, so they are open, I think it would be much easier. Because I've even had. Uh, interviews before where I knew that the person interviewing didn't really care what I had to say. So I think listening, I think them knowing that you're listening and you're, you're trying to understand and you're feeling what they're feeling, I think uh, that, that's what's important. I don't think uh, saying, oh, you know, what, 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 what you're going to be telling me it's going to be written. It's very important to our things and that. No, I think you have to deal with them just strictly on a, an understanding and it's that way. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> Thank you, Megan. All right, Nina? Thank you. Or did you say me? Oh, sorry, if we're going to order Johanna. <laughs> Hi, okay. So um, I guess my next question is on authenticity. Yeah. So um, my question is, uh, what were some criticisms you received either from your family or from people who actually knew your mother or even just uh, Pacific scholars in general of you publishing a Chamorro novel, however, not being able to speak Chamorro. So what did either Chamorros who knew you or didn't know you uh, have to say about you? Um, you know, that I was a coconut I was half a holly, you know, <laughs> all those things that, that you know, uh, frankly, I didn't care because I knew what I was had written was true, that they couldn't fault me on, they never faulted me on anything that I prevented as evidence and that, that it was incorrect that it was misleading or a lie or anything, that never on what I wrote, but also, but only about uh, who wrote it. And um, that, frankly, that, that really didn't bother me because if, if you stand behind what you, what you write and you, you, you feel that that's what you needed to say and that's how you feel about it, I don't think you have to apologize to anybody. Um, look at it this way. We have, uh, you know, I'm not criticizing the educational, you know, uh, system or, or, you know, things like that, but the, the writings up until that time had to do basically with facts and no emotion. I brought the emotion into the, into the facts, into the history. And that certainly wasn't an academic thing. So, I think a lot of the, the problems is they were looking at it academically and not looking at it as a fictionalized biography. And um, 
to this day, it, it really doesn't bother me. Uh, just like I can type in Chris Paris Howard on Google and it'll bring up uh, things and also studies, even done uh, from the first printing by the University of the South Pacific, studies and in-depth uh, writing on what I said. And uh, the main criticism, uh, most of it was very positive because it was the first one that had been written uh, in Micronesia of that nature. And the, uh, most of the criticism had to do with, I wasn't native enough. I didn't speak about all those uh, people that uh, were against uh, the military and, you know, uh, and uh, I wasn't giving voice to, uh, to those people, <coughs> the tomorrow people that really didn't like what was going on and stuff like that. Um, they were trying to give an academic argument to a love story. And so that's the way, that's the way I look at it because my intention was not, was, was certainly not to write a political statement or a uh, indigenous statement. It was to write a book. It was to write a love story. And the, the historical aspect of it was only necessary for me at that time to give the background and the environment for the love story. Only later did I realize how important that background and, and, and stuff was. Um, one of the most difficult things I think, I'm just bringing this up out of, it, it doesn't have that much to do, I don't think with your question, but one of the most difficult things I have in writing is that I'm not good at writing things like the sky was very blue, uh, the streams of wind came weaving around the houses. I'm not good at that. I'm not good at writing sympathy cards, uh, you know, I, I'm just not good at that type of writing. So that was the most difficult part in my writing was those scene setting things. I really had to work hard on those scene setting things because I just don't have the, the, the facility to write those types of things, right? Um, so I would think that, I would tell people that uh, writers that you have to write the world and in which you see and not because other people are seeing it or, you know what I mean other people are reading it you have to be uh, true to yourself write what you feel uh, what you um, intend to express who your audience is that you're expressing it to and to do that with the best of uh, your ability um, I find that uh, those limitations and limitations similar to those, each writer has to know what their limitation is, what they're good at, what they're not good at, and uh, only use those things that you, I, one would consider <coughs> limitations in order to, uh, because of the necessity of it and not because it, 
it's important to do. What I'm afraid of now is that with all this, these apps where I'm at, where it, it shows you sentence structure and corrects this and that and everything. I'm afraid that after a while, everything's going to be the same. And there, after that, that happens, where's the creativity? I love things that are different. I love things that are, are written different than other things. I want to be able to understand what is being said, but I enjoy the difference. I enjoy the rhythm. I enjoy hearing uh, what someone is telling me in, 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 the, in the writings. Sorry, I went off on a tangent. No, it's okay. It's okay. I guess I, I guess what I was trying to ask was what were the criticisms from the first edition that you had to incorporate into the new edition? But I think it's okay. No, but uh, the, 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 I, I think that I did have to do it. And I had to merge what Lola brought up. I had to merge that aspect of a lovely Chamorro girl with her mind, with her, her activism. I think that was very, very important that I was able to, to present a more authentic and I think uh, a more realistic view of my mother. Did that answer it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No, but no, really. No, I, I, I had to. I had to work on that area of it because I wrote that book. After I wrote it is when I realized that I was a Chamorro. I didn't, dear, I didn't know I was a Chamorro until I came here, as far as I knew, I was half Guamanian and half American. I didn't know I was Chamorro. I was stunned when I went to Mexico and people started speaking Spanish to me like I was a native. Those were those times. So when I came and I wrote that book, it was only during the time of writing in the book that I could say that I was Chamorro. So part of the book, those areas needed to be addressed because I wasn't a full-fledged Chamorro when I wrote that book. It was after I wrote it. And although I touched on hinges of being Chamorro and um, you know different thoughts of it and all of that, it's what lies inside. And I'll tell you, if I had been, if I was still in the U.S. and still, still in the environment I grew up in, without exposure to other Chamorros and without an interest in, in uh, communicating at, with them, I would still think that I was a, a white American, but different. Maybe okay. that answers your question. <laughs> All right. So it reminded you of who you are. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. It taught me. <laughs> yeah. Johanna, I think I'd like to provide a little context for what Chris is trying to say. Um, I wanted, I hope it can, sh I can sh you can see it. But so Chris and his sister, after the war, this is them right after the war with their grandmother, their Chamorro grandmother, their mother had been killed. He was this little. And then his father, who was still a prisoner of war, came back about a year later and plucked him out of the island that was all he knew. He'd already lost his mother. He was raised by his grandmother. And then all of a sudden, here he is with his father and if you look at his face and his sister's face they're like who is this guy their father left when they were just a baby 
all of a sudden they're taken to a, a hospital in Hawaii. They're, they're with their father who they'd never known. And they're, everybody's speaking English. They grew up speaking Chamorro. And all of a sudden his father takes him to a farm in Indiana and all his relatives are white. He's never, he never again hears Chamorro. They stay in touch with his family, but it's not that he's going home to Guam. It's not that he's able to Lola. really understand. So I think Lola. like that's a really important context in terms of what he's saying. It's that in writing the book, he also discovered this part of his culture that he was plucked out of. Well, let me explain, uh, expand on that, uh, is that when I was taken to the farming community, they really literally thought that we were something out of National Geographic at that time. Um, how could they really not when there were, if a plane flew over, my sister and I dove under the bed. When we would go out and chew corn stalks thinking they were uh, sugar cane, uh, not valuing fine furniture by scratching it with uh, uh, safety pins, throwing our food that we didn't like underneath the stove. I mean, those were the things. Since that time, we were taught to be American. We were taught to be, at that time, white Americans in every aspect of our life. I always grew, grew up thinking I was different, but thinking in the mind that I was white. <clears throat> so to come back, to go through the process of writing, to find out that I wasn't who I was at all, led me to become an activist after reading the history. Uh, th there are criticisms, in fact. Uh, but I, I, like I said, I, I, I don't mind them because at least there are people that are trying to understand and see something, you know, and study something. I think that's valuable, whether it's negative or positive. It's valuable. Sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> Is there any other questions? All right, thank you, Johanna. I believe um, Eddie and then Nina. So Eddie, did you wanna um, ask your question? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Kina. I just want to again thank you uh, for your time. Um, uh, with uh, is, I guess um, I just want to say that um, I greatly appreciate um, what you said earlier about um, just figuring or just coming to the realization that you're tomorrow. I find that that um, that really spoke to me. It's such mm -hmm. a universal. It's such a universal. Um, just that line. It's it's like because we also are like experiencing the, the culture clash of having grown up and believing ourselves to be fully American and then coming into the realization that we're actually indigenous Chamorro. I find, I find that myself growing up in this island, I did not realize that I was indigenous. So I, I totally, I found that that statement that that was very, that really spoke to me. So I wanna thank you for uh, sharing your experience with us. Yeah, this is something a lot of us in, uh, uh, indigenous people that, that don't understand actually who we are, uh, yeah. you know, go through. Uh, what are you writing about? Um, well, I, I'd love to share like, um, okay, um, I'm just, I, I'm writing, a, I like to write a lot about like um, going into like mythology, uh, the Chamorro mythology and stuff like that. Um, Good. It's, yeah, <clears throat> thank you. I, um, so the question I wanted to ask is, uh, um, particularly in the uh, the revisited version of Marikita, did you find mm. yourself infusing some of your thoughts, characteristics, or qualities when depicting your mother? A lot. A lot. Um, I 
I also got interested in clothing <laughs> and outfits. <laughs> no, there were a lot of things. That, that was a, a j joke. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of things. A lot of things that, that, that uh, I, I feel uh, that I have characteristics that are, that are similar. Um, I think um, one of the similarities that uh, that I share is that, uh, but it may be it have been harder for me is that when I found something that was that I didn't want to do that, but I didn't do them because it was out of fear. I decided that I would do it anyway, because it was only fear that was keeping me from doing it. Um, I think that's a quality that she, that, that she had, is that uh, facing one's fears. Um, I didn't want to do this interview, this conversation. <laughs> now I'm glad that I did it. That's what happens sometimes when you, you know, when you, uh, Based your fears, it's most of the time it turns out very well. And really, and I'm happy to be with you to, this afternoon. I'm happy to be with you all night. I'm happy to be with you too, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. And last but not least, Nina. Um, when it came to some of the uh, dialogue and the personal aspects of the, the characters, um, how much creative license did you take to, um, you know, come up with the dialogue or come up with the, the thought processes of the character when it's, it's part, I know you interviewed a lot of um, your family and the people there, but yeah, how much was it, was your own creative input? 90%. Ninety percent. I'll tell you that was so difficult. But I think that when you get to know people and a lot of different types of people and everything, you start developing um, an understanding of what type of uh, person that is uh, through those interactions. Um, it was difficult, but I have a way sometimes of uh, tuning everything out and becoming something else. And uh, I sort of became those characters uh, when I was going through that thinking process. Now, what would I have said, right? And I don't just think of what I would have said, but I visualize that, that person. I become the person. And so I'm talking what I assume they were talking to be the truth. I just hope that a lot of those conversations didn't, came out as truth and didn't come out of that I was just adding them. How did you, how did you find those conversations? I really wasn't sure. I, of course, I questioned it, like how you would be able to come up with what your mother would say to herself. But then, yeah, because. Yeah, so I wasn't sure. And then I just wondered how much of a percentage were actual quotes, quotes that people told you. Well, that was good because you weren't unsure. That mean, meant that I did something right. <laughs> because if, if you weren't unsure, it would mean I, I blew it, right? <laughs> no, uh, I, was, I, I, I was aware that this was a, a very difficult thing. I tried to put myself, they say, put yourself in another person's shoes. Uh, but here in Guam and that, at that time, there weren't really any shoes. So, you know, put, you, put, you, put yourself in other person's stories or something. It's, it was... <laughs> and, 
Anyone else? Anyone else? Because this is probably going to be my last interview. Do you have any uh, new drawings to show no, us? Joking. Oil paintings? No, I don't. You know, in all my travel, I don't even, I, I don't know if Lola noticed it, but I don't even have books here. In all my travels and everything, I've lost things. I've had things stolen. Uh, <laughs> I mean, everything that you could imagine. Um, when I returned to Guam, I came back with three suitcases, and that was it. And um, I don't, I, I don't really believe in possessions uh, very much. I, I believe in having what you need. Uh, and uh, at this stage in my life, if I read a book and finish a book, I usually give it away uh, because uh, I don't want a lot of books when I go that someone has to deal with. <laughs> Did you get that? I'm so happy my children love books because they're going to inherit like thousands. <laughs> I feel you though. That's a good point. <laughs> oh, that's good. But you know, I don't, I, I don't have children. I, I, I live by myself. Mm. Uh, I'm happy. Uh, and to be able to have this conversation is also meaningful because I'm connecting with people. And uh, that's very difficult during these times. So thank you so much, everyone. Oh, the book so names. Gonna, Akina's gonna introduce uh, the names. I mean, introduce the what they're for, and then we'll go ahead and have you pick the names, okay? So um, we had a we had a raffle online. So Akina, if you don't mind uh, sharing what, what we did. No, but Megan already knows that she's one of the ones. Uh, to I our made a online listeners. I made a mistake uh, before the, the you know. <laughs> Uh, and the mention name the name she was on. She knew she already won. So the other one is uh, Teresita Smith. Okay, so Chris, I'm sorry. Uh, Akina is going to introduce what the names are for, and then you can read the names. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in promoting today's events, we had different trivia questions on our Instagram, Facebook stories that um, promote Marikita. So anyone who submitted their answers um, got entered into our raffle and will be winning a signed copy of Marikita Revisited. So Chris, if you'd like to announce the names. <laughs> and so just for context, Chris picked the names right before the event. And so our writers that are tuning in know, but the audience is now going to hear who are our two winners. Okay, the one that already knows, Megan Tidegui. <laughs> <laughs> And the other one is Teresita Smith. Viva! Congratulations. Um, right, thank so you. Megan got many gifts today. Uh, her questions answered in a free bit book. So Viva Megan! Um, Chris, it is such an honor as always to hear you speak and uh, just the layers of uh, messages that you shared with us and life lessons have been incredible. Um, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Um, and to those watching online, uh, we hope you stay tuned every month as we uh, welcome new writers and, and other creative people to join in creative conversation with our Menyatu. So thank you again to um, all of our writers who joined today for your incredible questions um, and to Akina for organizing this event and this wonderful writing fellowship. Uh, Chris, do you want to say anything before we tune out? Yeah, I, I, I want to uh, thank uh, the writers uh, for asking their questions. Uh, they were very questions. Um, I have gone uh, and spoken to a lot of groups of people, and uh, when I've asked for questions, nobody has any questions. <laughs> and I ended up having to talk the whole darn time. And I really thank you. Thank you for your questions. I hope I, I uh, answered them satisfactory. And if I didn't, tell Lola, and she would contact me, and then I will find some way of answering it. 
So before we log off, I'm going to shift to gallery view. So, and if everybody could just smile and wave just one last time. Uh, Megan, if you don't mind turning back on your camera. And we'll just say goodbye to our audience. All right, goodbye. Adios, bye.